Between the time when wargamers played with chainmail and the rise of the wizards of the coast, there was an age of gamers. And unto this, Gygax, destined to bear the crown jewel of TSR upon a troubled brow, to show you all how to roll for initiative. Issue number 64 of the Roll for Initiative podcast. I'm one of your hosts, DM Vince, sitting in along with DM Nick. Hello, everybody. Coming back again, DM Will. Hey there. And sitting in by popular demand by the ladies, producer Matt. Hi, everyone. We got a great show for you tonight. Uh, let's start with some gaming we've been doing. Nick, what have you been whoa, doing whoa, for gaming? Wait a minute. What? For the ladies? <laughs> Well, I noticed there was a couple posts of people, some of the ladies saying, where's Matt and where's Matt, so. Oh, got some groupies <laughs> going on there, huh, yeah. man? So yeah. Matt's, Matt's got some lady groupies going on. Yeah. Oh. Awesome. Yeah. The, nice. the advantages of being the one single man of the group. Oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, gaming. Uh, Nothing this week. How about you? <laughs> Book of Sorrows just started. Oh, uh, Cool. Now we're just we're still debating on what we're gonna do in our gaming group, uh, like what we want to play. So that's where we're at right now. I'll know cool. in a couple of weeks. Uh, week one, Book of Sorrows. Already, the players are in trouble. <laughs> uh, they destroyed a uh, potion shop, blew up the whole entire shop, including the the owner and all the guards. And now they're sounds on the- like to a rip roaring start. Yeah, now they're on the run from the town. <laughs> oh. That that reminds me of a Star Wars uh, uh, revised core rules game I ran that saw my players involved in a gunfight with each other to start the session. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, um, yeah. If it, a player ever decides to pitch a character concept to you that involves them being a homicidal maniac, don't let them. Just saying. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Good plan. So, what have you been right. playing, Matt? Uh, really, I haven't had a chance to do any ga- game playing as of late. Uh, my gaming group just do do various things, keep canceling our sessions. I have done some writing, though. I have a, I do some uh, t- tabletop game reviews for diehardgamefan.com, and I right now have a review of Obliette Issue 6 uh, yeah. that's for... Uh, OSR and Labyrinth Floor. It's really good for like two dollars and fifty cents. It really reminds me of like the Dragon magazines of old. Even has the comic strips and it has your articles and reviews. It's a really good and worth checking out. Yeah, yeah. Obliant's a really good uh, magazine. That that and uh, Knoxville's pretty good too. But I've read a couple of issues of Obliant. Very good stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we did a, we did a full review of that on uh, Save or Die actually. I think two mm. issues ago. Okay, cool. I'll have to check that out and hear uh, what you guys had to say about it. Yeah. Uh, Will, what have you been up to? Oh, pretty much the same thing. I uh, ran my normal four games uh, this week and everything, and the uh, uh, the best part about it is, though, the, the second D&D group that I have here will be going into Ravenloft next week. Uh-oh. They have uh-huh. no idea what's going on. They have no idea yet. None of them have ever played it before, so this is going to be fun. Now they know. that. The first edition game, huh? Oh yes, cool. Because he only plays first edition games, and that's all he supports, right? Well, right, yeah, that's right. That's you're, you're right. <laughs> None of that path. Yeah, I, I stuff. read that too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so like, since what? Nick Nick is already on that, uh, the forums osrgaming.org dot org. Oh yes, slash forums. forums. <laughs> you can go there and chat it up with everybody. And Nick put in two posts today. Not yes. one, but two. Nick, what do you got? To uh, say? Where do I start? Yes, Will is a legit first edition first edition AD and D guy. He does run the game, so ha, there. <laughs> <laughs> and and two, I am really surprised at the this, this whole railroad thing. I'm sorry. I'm not using railroad as a derogatory term. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's one of those terms that's been around for, I don't know, for quite some time when 
talking about adventures and just I don't know some some people are taking it very seriously. Seven pages long worth of debating in there. Yes, yes, I'm really surprised. Very surprised. It just guys lighten up. <laughs> We're talking. We're heatedly debating a game about fairies, dragons, and elves. Let's keep it in perspective here, all right? <laughs> let's not get all. Let's not get our cod pieces in a bunch. And <laughs> keep it up, and Nick, of, Nick might get the ten posts finally. Yeah, I know it could happen. <laughs> I know I could be twenty. Oh, I don't wow. know, but uh, I think Matt's it's, beating it's, you. Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's crazy. Yeah. I have to get all Christopher Walken on you. Nice. Stab me with my plus five scimitar. Definitely the skull. Come to the forum, sign up, and join in the fun with uh, ra- railroad bashing and <laughs> or defending, whichever one you want. And Nick will come in there and uh, rouse it all up again. Uh, I, rouse it, rouse you, it all up? I was trying to calm it down. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, you going to that convention you normally go to? Uh, was it Con on the Cob? Con on the Cob. Yeah, you know, that's um, in the next couple of weeks, I think. Yeah. Um, I hope to go for, you know, like a day or two to check it out. I haven't been to it yet. I heard it's been very good. You know, it's a small local con up here in uh, northeast Ohio in um, Hudson, Ohio. And I believe as after this is posted, it's, I think, two weeks from now. I yeah. think it's mid-October. Probably. And uh, so, yeah, it's a good four day. It's, I believe it's a four day con. It's Thursday through Sunday. Woo. So I know no, that's nice. Yeah, last couple of years, I know uh, Larry Elmore's been there as the artist guest of honor. Um, so, um, yeah, if you have, if you're in the area, you know, at least you know Ohio, PA, you know, might want to come and check it out. I I hope to go. I hope to get the the time to do it. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because next year I plan on doing some more out of state cons and everything. And that was one of the cons that I do have targeted on my list here. So definitely, if I come in that area, you better be there. If I'm going to be there, we're going to be doing some gaming. Okay. <laughs> Is that right? Dang. Oh. <laughs> You're lucky. You got all Marine on me. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I got my local con coming up in November. We don't get any celebrities in mind, so. Wish we did. I'm supposed to be sorry about that? Yes, you should be. Oh, I am. Uh, some news on the Osric front. I, the, there has been a player's reference book released by moi. Moi? That's right, I did. I, I yes. retro... Who's th- moi? I never heard of him. Me, Nick. <laughs> I know. I uh, hacked up and put together a player reference book in two different sizes, normal and A5 size for traveler size. So if you're nice. interested in picking up just the player's reference or just the players have a player's handbook and they don't see the monsters or the DM section, it is perfect. You can go over to Knights and Knaves in their forum, and there's a topic there, or you can go on Lulu and uh, just search for player's reference, Osric, and you'll find it. Yeah, It's oh, also this... on uh, Drive Through RPG as well. It's actually posted oh, it in their uh, weekly uh, uh, newsletter. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, what's that link? Uh, just uh, I'll put it up in the show notes. Actually, yeah, I'll put it in the show notes. It, it's up on uh, Drive Through RPG because I actually that's how I actually downloaded it. Cool. And Con on the Cob, I just saw is um, it is October thirteenth through the sixteenth, and uh, you can go to cononthecob.com dot com to check it out. Yay. You know what? There was no way I was going to make it that year. I mean, this year, because the uh, prequel to The Thing is coming out October 14th. Yes, I saw that. That the prequel actually to looks the very thing? good. Oh. What? Really? <laughs> the prequel no. to The Thing they're making? Yeah. Does that go right up there with Footloose, the movie remake? No, I don't want... We're, no, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. Jeez. Oh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of that. <laughs> Let's head into some sage advice. Master! Master! They're at the gates again! Master! It looks like another band of adventurers! Adventurers? Again? Always the same. Coming to me for sage advice. 
All right, Sage Advice this week, we actually have a voicemail sage with three emails. Advice. Sage Advice. <laughs> wow, Will's getting into it half-heartedly. <laughs> half-heartedly. <laughs> so we have a voicemail, and guess who it's from, Nick? Um, let me guess. Uh, full-on gamer? Yeah, every time I see this voicemail, you always guess this person's name. The one time I tell you, you don't guess her name. Oh, Lass? Yes. Oh, hi, Lass. <laughs> All right, mute your microphones. I'll give you this play. Hi, fellas. It's Lass, and I have a question for the RFI podcast. I know it's been a while. I hope you guys missed me. <laughs> so my question relates to a game that I was playing with Dramamon from our boards. Shout out. <laughs> Anyway, the game I was playing at Druid, and one of the spells I was using was Perdice Flame. Now, the spell goes on to say, blah, 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 blah. The Druid is capable of hurling the magical flame as a missile, with a range of four. The flame will flash upon impact, igniting combustibles within a tree diameter of its center of impact. And then extinguished itself. So, our question was, what kind of damage happens to you if you are ignited within that little tree diameter? We eventually settled on 1d6. Play, be interested to hear what you fellas think of it. Love the show as always. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you, Lass. Lass, you're you're. Oh my goodness, that little laugh of hers. Anyway, uh, <laughs> she's neck. It's just it's so cute. Anyway, yeah, produce flame, right? Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, hmm. I think a D six sounds uh, appropriate for the damage. Yeah, I get. Uh, I would do D six as well. Maybe. Um, and what level is that spell? It is a uh, second level spell. Yeah, uh, produce flame. I might even say yes. a D six plus one per level of the caster. I might even go even go that far. Uh, two D six. Two D six. Yeah. So almost like a two D six fireball. Mm. Just... <laughs> I think I would give it a one D eight. I mean, you know. Per the description of the spell, you know, I mean, it will cause combustion of inflammable materials, paper, cloth, dry wood, oil. Hmm. Huh. Well, I, I do 2d6. That's close enough. Hmm. Hmm. I, I think I would do a d8 plus the caster's level. Or, yeah, yeah d8 plus caster's level, not d6. Yeah, but you know what else is good now? Yeah, when I see that thing about Produce Flame, though, it says the flame will flash on impact, igniting combustibles, and then extinguish itself. So this isn't something like it's going to be a big thing of fire. It's going to hit, hard, poof, it's gone. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm like a D6 or D8 plus the caster's level. So like if, if it's a seventh level Drew, it's a D6 plus seven, you know. I think that, you know, could produce enough of a flash boom, and then it's gone. So. Well, it's almost gone, uh, you know, per the druid. The druid allows it to, you know, stay there. Right, right. Hmm. I'm going to be very careful with that being a second level spell, though, because, you know, for a you know, druid, a druid can cast that multiple times. You know, who needs a fireball spell when you have a druid there casting it? Right. Yeah, because well, at that point, all you need is a flask of oil, splash it around, your quick little uh, produce flame, then all of a sudden you have an entire room or building burning down. Okay. Yes, sir. It's great for your arsonist druid. <laughs> <laughs> the arsonist druid. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. It's a new class. Yes. All right. Thanks, Lass. Uh, anyone who wants to send in a voicemail, 570-865-4210, the hotline. The hotline. Yes. Where kobolds are standing by? Yes, kobolds this week. Uh, the goblins left. Oh, really? Did they get fired? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, right. Wasn't paying them enough in Electrum. Ah. <laughs> we got, uh, first email comes from DM Dwayne from uh, the OSR Gaming Forums. And he says, okay, 
So here's my question. How do you pronounce Ion Stones? Is it Ion or Ion or what? More important to me, at least, question is, how long do they remain active in Dr. Evil quotes, by the way? I don't think that it is effective as... as bleh. I don't think the effect is permanent, so a few rounds, turns, days, keep up the good work. They, as far as I know, they spin around your noggin until you grab them. Yeah. So the effect is there. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I have to agree with that, that once, you know, you throw it up in the air and it revolves around you, that's when the powers are activated. The moment you catch them or and then put them in your pocket or a bag of holding or whatever, that's they're it. The powers stop. Yes, they're deactivated. Yeah. Until and you toss as, it up again. Yeah. As for the pronunciation, this is something when looking up our creature feature theater, I found an article in Dragon Magazine. Mm-hmm. It's uh, issue 93, page 24, a pronunciation guide to monsters. Awesome. Ah. And Ion Stone is in it, and it's actually pronounced Yoon Stone. It's Y O O N S T O. N is the pronunciate is how the phonetic pronunciation is. So, oh, it's a so it's a Yunstone. Okay, I've been yeah. saying it wrong. Okay, well, I've been saying it. it for wrong all these years. For sure, no. I wouldn't say y'all was saying it wrong. We all have different dialects. I mean, I seen it, you know, pronounced Ion and Ion and Uon and <laughs> just floating stones. Yeah, there you go. Okay, next email comes from Andrew. Hi guys, just finished listening to your discussion about the Dungeoneering 1E book and wanted to chime in about the skills, a.k.a. non-weapon proficiencies. Old school Mm -hmm. gamers could not even agree on whether non-weapon proficiencies are old school or not. Some people prefer rolling against arbitrary targets or ability scrolls, where others want targets based on skill points or non-weapon proficiency slots. When you get started with D&D, you have no reference for what a PC can do or how hard the task may be. Few people have tried to bash open a door, climb a steep slope, or leap from platform to platform in fantasy dungeons. Skill systems are valuable here, even if they are not used, because they give new players an idea of things they could try. Even the ridiculous example of having of having a light campfire skill has some value. It is silly to think that some adventures with years in the wilderness cannot light a fire, but it is good to have a scale to determine how hard uh, it would be for that adventure to light a fire in an icy rain to avoid hypothermia. Vince might say roll 4d6 to try to get under your vision, but a new player would have no idea where to start. I'm glad you were carrying on the show. Please keep up the good work. Cheers, Andrew. Comments? Well. Yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow, wow. Full comments, guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm not thinking about this one. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I mean, I... Uh, I understand exactly what he's saying, and I think for newer players, having some frame of reference of this is what my character would know actually is useful because not everyone is good at just naturally fleshing out what their character can and can't do and what knowledge they may or may not have. Some of some players need to have it spelled out more directly, and that's where I think non-weapon proficiencies and secondary skills actually do come in handy. It's just fleshing out a character. Giving a direction to flesh out a character. Oh, and I'd like to add, if you're going to pick on me, at least do it right. It's 3d6. Try to get under your wisdom, not 4. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Um, no, but it's a, it's a fantasy game. You can do whatever you want. Why do you need something laid out for you? Just say it and well, try because, it. Because some people need that. Some some players do. I can, I can completely understand where that mindset comes from, especially... When you're talking about in the past 10, 15 years with the generation of gamers where they're used to like online role playing games and computer role playing, where you there are skill sets for a lot of things. And if you don't have that skill, you cannot do it. So that's probably where that assumption goes. If you don't have that skill, you can't do it. Well, there's two ways you could, I think you could go about this. Either A, with a new player, you say, don't worry about that. You could just let me know what you want to do, and I'll let you know if you can do it. Plain and simple, you know. Or you might go the other way. 
okay, let's have some skills. Let's have some of these non-weapon proficiencies, and we'll use that. If you, whatever the, I would say whatever feels more comfortable. I think you got established it, though, mm. at the beginning of the game, at the beginning of a campaign or whatever. That's the, po- um, that's the poisoning of later editions in the minds of these people. The poison. It's, I'm telling you. If it's you a- want to call it a poison. Oh, great. All right. Great. All right. Now we're going to get here from Backlund's Hammer. Good job. Good no, job. I've, been saying, I've been saying poisoning for, for the past two years of this show. So the post-2000 uh, editions of D&D have always encouraged these skills and everything like that. And people, like, see the skills. Okay, then that means I can do it. If I don't have the skill, I can't do it. And it even pretty much says it right in the books. If you don't have the skill, you're going to have a heck of a time doing it. So people coming back to these first edition and, oh, you know, classic are all like, oh, my God, I don't have skills. That means I can't do anything. And they get all freaked out and they have to have it laid on paper for them. You don't have to have it. It's first edition. Right. Just think it. But out. also, there is, a, there is a set of rules that you can put that into AD&D if you so wanted to. I, yeah, it's again, called playing second it before, edition. That's one of the beauties of AD and D. It's 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 um, it's almost like you can take things in and out of the game and it won't break. Yeah, it's called playing second edition. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my whole take on this, you know, with mm-hmm. non weapon deficiencies and then something stating that you can't do it because you don't have this. I disagree with that totally because my my idea of this as a DM. It's much easier to say no than it is yes. It's the lazy way out. I tell every player, if they want to do something, you do have a chance of doing it. But it's highly unlikely that you'll be successful. But I will tell you that you can. It's high, there is a chance you can do it. Right. I don't like saying no to players. I despise saying no to players because saying right. no is the easiest way. It's the lazy way. Put some yeah. time and effort, some thought into it. Be creative. The sky is the limit with a fantasy role-playing game. Right, exactly. Your your imagination is your limit. Harumph. <laughs> Harumph. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Johnson's right about Mr. Johnson. Okay. <laughs> he, just, he just sounded off for you there, Nick, all right? Okay. All right. Andrew also wrote uh, a little bit later. He wrote, I remember you guys talking about... Um, I know exactly what that, Okay. I remember you guys talking about a book that was sold to conventions, collecting Gary's post in a comprehensive comprehensive publication. Can you tell me what the title is and if it could be purchased online? As far as I know, it can't be purchased online. It was being given as a donation to people that no, it was given. It was a free thing that they were giving away for people who donated at the OSR gaming booth at Gen Con. Mm. I think you could still get one if you go to their website, and I think their website offhand is theosrg.blogspot.com. Matt, can you t- uh, take a look at that later on and see if that's what it is? And, uh, put yeah, it I'll, I'll find it and put the exact link in the show notes. So. Yeah, but I believe they, they only had it for a limited time, so you can maybe ask them. Maybe they're selling it. I don't know. Maybe get a hold of Gail Gygax, and she can uh, sell you it. I'm not sure. She's pretty easy to reach on Facebook, so. All right, that's all the letters we have for this week. If okay. you want to email us, uh, you can email us by going where, Nick? Um, you can go to staff at gmail.com, I believe. Yes, you can. Woo-hoo! That's right. And that's from memory. Oh. To oh. the website trying to find it. Or you can also call us. And leave a message at 570-865-4210. And you can talk to us as long as you need to. And uh, maybe even Vince will pick up. Yeah. <laughs> no, not again. Or, or, or there's a third option. You can go directly to the website and go where it says email the host. And you don't even have to go to your email to do it. You just fill out that little form right there. Oh, gr- goody. And we'll head into table matters. Yeah, I remember back in the day, a fella knew how to judge a fireball on the fly and how far the cleric could push the undead he turned. I tell ya, with all these min-maxers and munchkins, metagame and power game, there's something missing that I'm here to learn ya. Now sit down and crack your book while I commence to teach ya some. Table Manners. 
Table Manners. Today, we're going to discuss one of the most controversial character classes in first edition AD&D. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's the most controversial. I think it's the second most controversial next to the Paladin. Yeah. We're going to talk about, yeah, do you think so? I thought so yeah. as well, too. Yeah, me too. Uh, the Assassin. That is what we're going to talk about today, the Assassin. Just a little bit of history there on the Assassin character class. Uh, he made his first appearance in the Blackmoor Supplement in 1975. From there on, the Assassin then was also a subclass of the Thief in his next appearance in 1st Edition AD in 1977. So I know some of the questions that come up on Assassin. How does one play an Assassin appropriately? <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> that's a really tough question, and you all chime in when you feel you hear otherwise. But basically, in the player's handbook, first edition, page 29, the primary function of an assassin is killing. That's how you play an assassin. No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But you only for them. money. Only for yeah. money. That's right. Otherwise, you're just that's playing a thief. Pretty much an underrated thief of that, too, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But as I stated before, you know, the uh, the assassin is a subclass of the thief with a reduced capacity to that effect, uh, which I'll explain a little later on how the skills are reduced drastically and how we can change that. But, um, yes, that is what the assassin is for, is to kill things, mostly humans and sentient beings. And I think that's that's the primary uh, problem that people have with assassins and their alignment. And mm. per the player's handbook, it specifically states that assassins are evil in alignment as the killing of humans and other intelligent life forms that are pretty much a low life or a, a low, you know, thought in a civilized society. Mm-hmm. And that's where one of the things I got issues with the assassin. I, I really don't understand the restriction to an evil alignment. Yeah, I would say you can be a neutral alignment such as... Yeah. Uh, chaotic neutral or lawful neutral if you're going to allow them to be lawful evil. Right. Well, I think what the issue that we have here is when an assassin is, is an assassin killing or is he murdering? So that I think is the key concept right there in a civilized society because a civilized society and understand I'm not talking about real world mechanics because I do not put real world mechanics into my fantasy role playing games. Right. But I would suspect that if you are in a good society based on good laws and everything killing and murder is definitely defined different i suspect that if good point. an mp good you know point. that an npc has someone's house broken into they have a right to defend their property by killing the intruder however yeah. assassins are going underneath the, the law of the land by taking money for profit and assassinating murdering people because they're trying to take something that isn't really theirs right. or whatever the case may be. Right. There's a pre it's premeditated, I think, is the main key. It's planned yes, out this will be killed as opposed to in your example, you killing someone who's uh breaking into your house. You didn't plan on killing anyone that evening. It was a matter of self defense. There was no intent and a uh, long thought out process put into the killing. It was just more of a reaction. Exactly. Unless That's I get the myself key thing. a really good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hang the lawyers. <laughs> But yes, I think that's what the biggest issue right now or the controversy is. Why can't an assassin be of a different alignment? Now, I did see one time or two times on the forum where someone posted that adventuring groups are basically assassins because the thought is, well, the king will give your group a thousand gold pieces to go to this dungeon to slay all the monsters, take their loot, and come back. Oh, yeah. No. Nah. Yeah? No, nah, I disagree with that entirely and everything. I, I just don't believe that, that you know, that party eventually are now assassins, especially if there's a paladin in charge of that group, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, we're taught in the book that all monsters but the humanoid races are all evil, and but we must what, kill evil instantly, so... Right, but what if instead of being a group of monsters, it's a uh, evil dictator of a rival kingdom who's, like, torturing people and suppressing them and... And your king is say, hey, I will give you this money to destroy this other evil person. Now it's not an orc. It's actually a human. What's the difference? It's your society upbringing. That's right. the whole key thing. And yes, you're right, man. That's a good point. What's the difference between... Now, the player's handbook specifically states humans 
and other intelligent life forms for the purpose. So that's the issue, right? The intelligent life forms, which means equates into orcs are intelligent. They right. have intelligence. They can think, and, and you know, so that's the key thing, right? There, most important of all is is you know what is is considered an assassin. And uh, I'm sorry to say that adventuring groups are not assassin, and that doesn't make mercenaries who are hired assassins either. Mm. Or if you're if you're paid to guard or you know watch a caravan of goods go from point A to point B, you're to defend that caravan against brigands. That doesn't make you an assassin. No, yeah, that is yeah, no. no. It's like thinking of it in, in real world world uh, ethics. I know you don't add this into your game, Will, but just just put, <laughs> putting it over there. Thinking of when the U.S. was uh, you know, the colonists were breaking away from the British. The British was the tyranny, evil empire, and the you know supposedly the the colonists were the good guys. Well, the the British saw the the colonists as evil people trying to break away from them. So you can see it that way too. So it's your just yes. your society upbringing. I agree to that, and so that is funny because I had, you know, I had a conversation with a gentleman a while back ago about the, the that analogous, the analogous relationship between us supporting the rebels in Afghanistan, but guess what? We were during that time period. We, we were rebels. We were rebelling against, you know, Britain, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. England. So, you know, again, we're supporting rebels. That doesn't make them, you know, criminals. No, it's the yes, society I, upbringing. I, I, whichever side you were born with, pretty much, is the one you're going to support. Exactly. So now I will get into this part here since, you know, we discuss alignment and everything. It's very interesting that in a issue of uh, White Dwarf, and that was specifically, I believe that was issue 39. I can't remember which issue that was. I should have wrote that down. But there is a alternative system for assassins in AD&D. Cool. And for those that don't know, that White Dwarf magazines number 1 through 90 were dedicated, you know, Two first edition AD and D, among other games in that time period, but you know only first edition. Mm-hmm. And I remember the author reading. The author was uh, Chris Felton, and he covered. He said he sees no reason why assassins can be of different alignments. Yeah. True, because it all yeah, like I said, it depends on the society upbringing. Where I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't see an assassin being lawful good though. No, I don't either. I think, um, I would think. You would have to rule out probably the good alignments for the class. Mm-hmm. I, I think you have to be a, of, at least on, on the uh, dual uh, alignment system that's an AD and D, you would have to be a mix of, you know, the uh, uh, neutral or evils. So you could be lawful neutral or chaotic neutral. Um, but as far as, you know, being of good alignment, uh, I could see I chaotic know. good being. Maybe chaotic good. Yeah, I could see yeah. chaotic good maybe doing that. But I couldn't see a neutral good or a lawful good being an assassin. No, neutral good would be too, you know, the too goody two shoe as well. So. Yeah, see, my only problem with chaotic being involved in that is how would you know if that assassin of that chaotic alignment is going to stick to the written agreement to assassinate someone upon payment? Money? Blackmail? No. Yeah. But wouldn't it be wouldn't a chaotic good assassin be those assassins that go to murder somebody and then they get offered money not to murder and go murder the other person instead? Or would that be considered a chaotic evil assassin? No, no. You know what? That that's that's good. That that's yeah. a good example right there. I would agree that it could be. Yeah, because they're really just in it for the money and they don't really care about killing and they go to kill and the person's like, I'll give you double. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But as we're discussing, you know, the primary function of the assassin is killing people, plain and simple, as per the first edition PHB. Now, their secondary skills, which is funny because it's mentioned that, that their secondary skills are spying, mm-hmm, and yeah. then their tertiary skills is their, is the, uh, the thieving abilities, which makes them a very underrated, uh, underpowered thief if you use them for anything else besides killing people and spying. Yeah. And you all know that because uh, the assassin is penalized heavily in thieving abilities, except backstabbing, whereas uh, they're penalized uh, two levels. Mm -hmm. So if they're like a fifth level assassin, their thieving abilities are as a third level uh, thief, which is, you know, that's, that's just terrible. And again, that alternate system for assassins that was mentioned in White Dragon, the author said, get rid of that. 
Yes, again, White Dwarf. I'm sorry. He said, get rid of that. And then, you know, he says, like, for example, like, with hear noise, minus three levels, climb walls, add two levels, read and comprehend language, plus two levels, you know, in, in you know, via comprehension of spells and so on, or comprehend language spells, forgive me for that. But, yes, it's amazing. It's a really good article and everything, and I, I probably, if anyone wants it, I can probably just go ahead and post that online and show people the alternative system for assassins in AD&D. Yeah, post in the library section. Right. Now, uh, in Dragon Magazines, uh, assassins have been mentioned in just a few things. Uh, Dragon Magazine number 22, which actually covers the historical, the actual historical aspect of assassins, how they were created by someone by name Hassan Sabah, who was an Iranian back in the years 1080, 1081. I believe that's when the assassins actually came into existence. Actually, a very interesting article on that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think that assassin stands for users of hashish or correct. the followers of Hassan. But even the that, hashish. that is, yeah, and that is historically, that's that's being debated right now because no one can come to agreement on which one it actually is. So that is an interesting article and something I'm going to look up further on to see how that's come along all these years since this article has been produced. Mm. It's funny, uh, even uh, speaking historically on this, uh, during the Crusades when the assassins were quite... Um, I wouldn't say prevalent, but they were they were there during that time. Uh, the The Knights Templar had some dealings with the assassins. Really? So, oh yeah, hmm. oh yeah, it's very well documented. They, uh, if not, if anything, they were seen not at, not necessarily as adversaries, but um, yeah, you could call them. Uh, they were opponents from time to time. I guess you might want to call it. Interesting. But uh, besides that magazine, uh, so Dragon Magazine had number 22 covered the first assassins. Dragon Magazine number 59 covers poisons. And I only bring that up because one thing that assassins are noted for is their use of poisons. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I had a question about that. In the PHB, how how they talk about poisons for the assassin. (laughs) Yes. It's like as soon as he unsheathes his weapon with with, uh, poison on it, He's already going to be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what it stated that, you know, that opponents, you know, can visually see see the uh, poison. But then again, like I said, that's debatable because there's some poison that, you know, that are colorless or whatever the case may be. So that's kind of weird how they had that set up. Mm-hmm. But that's interesting, yeah. And then Dragon Magazine number 64, that covers the Assassin's Guild. And I, I tell you, if anyone wants to play an assassin, that's the article to get right there. That really is an awesome article on Assassins, the Assassin's Guild, and their what you would call their code of conduct as an assassin. It gives you some more information on how to play the assassin properly. Yeah. Oh, yes, definitely, oh. especially if they're part of an assassin's guild now. And if you're not a member of an assassin's guild and there's an assassin's guild in that city, oh, yes, you better be careful because they will hunt you down and assassinate right. you. Yes, because if you kill someone and you're not part of the assassin's guild, you're infringing upon their jobs. So they don't yes. like it. So they come to hunt you down. All premeded murders... It, according to the Assassin Guild rules, must be solved by the Assassin's Guild if the person that did the murdering wasn't a member of the guild. All murders in the town must go through the guild, and if they don't, you have a so problem. They're with like the teamsters. Guild. Yeah, it's <laughs> yes, the, exactly. It, they're a union for assassins, basically. Yeah, it's the Assassins Union, local number ba- two seven five. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very, very protective of their territory, and it's. And this is where they distinguish about the difference between premeditated murder right. and non-premeditated murder. And to them, that's a huge difference. They, really, they don't really care about the drunken bar fight that broke out and someone got killed in. They don't care about that. because They care about who killed the uh, chief constable of the city. Yes, exactly. That's right. Cool. So oh, yes, if you definitely. want to do dealings with the Assassin's Guild, you can come to me. What do you want to do? You got Mickey Four Fingers here, Joey Bag of Donuts, we'll take care of you. <laughs> yeah. On this day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> That's right. You won't find a horse head, in this case a manticore head, in your bed. It's going to be a bad thing. All right, as we're getting off topic here, that's pretty much the Assassin in a nutshell. 
Now, yes. now we'll go into game mechanics. Oh man, what the heck is that? Stand aside, you fool! I have a spell that will work here! What do you mean I can't hit with that? All oh, right, fine. Show it to me in the book. Welcome to Game Mechanics. All right, uh, Game Mechanics. Uh, we're going to be talking about something out of the Wilderness Survival Guide. Yay. The Wilderness Survival Guide, everyone. Yay. One of those uh, books that's kind of on the uh, Twilight of first edition AD&D. And... Specifically, we're going to talk about like effects of weather, snow and cold, freezing, freezing your butts off out there in the in in, in the snow, and how not so fun it is. <laughs> so, Definitely we'll talk fun. about a little bit on the rules of the uh, in the wilderness survival guide. You know what might happen in certain circumstances, and you know if you want to use these sorts of rules. It's kind of it's kind of split up between two different sections. One. I looked at is dressing for the weather, starting on page 18 of that. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to page 21, effects of the environment. These two go hand in hand. How you're dressed and what's the environment that you're in. And in this case, we're talking about cold, ice, snow. Uh, On page 18 and 19, dressing for the weather in the wilderness survival guide, they talk about the various types of clothing. This also includes armor. So, and each one of the types of clothing and armor that you may wear has an effect on your effective temperature of of the character. And there are some modifiers. Either it adds or subtracts to it. And there's a nice little table, table number three. Yeah. It gives the attire and the effects of the temperature. And um, you have... Uh, Basically, where it says, like, a a tire is very cold, that means that's the type of a tire that, for the environment that's adapted to. So if you have very cold environment and a tire, you're talking, like, uh, bear skins, uh, maybe uh, heavy uh, leather, um, heavy cloth, um, I don't know, draping yourself in lard. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, okay. Forget I said the lard thing. Yeah. Uh, But it goes from very cold, cold, moderate, and hot. So really we're talking about very cold and cold weather. And then you have the various types of armors and what they can do. What you Say you're wearing uh, cold weather attire Mm -hmm. and it's zero degrees outside. What that will do is add 30 to the effective temperature of your character. And let's say... You uh, are also wearing uh, plate mail. They'll add another twenty. So you're as long as you stay within the positives, really, your your character is going to be fine in that sort of environment. Now, there are some other factors involved. Maybe uh, if you're what sort of uh, activity that your character is doing, if they're exerting themselves in a certain way. Obviously, if you're exerting yourself more, you're going to generate more heat. You know, that one of the laws of thermodynamics, I believe. Uh, so <laughs> that's the first half is, you know, the type of clothing. The other is the actual environment, what uh, type of environment that your character is in. And in this case, we're talking about uh, cold and snow. So a few things about that um, I kind of picked out is um, like a ice and sleet storm. Mm-hmm. And a ice and sleet storm, as fierce as it may seem, and this is out of the uh, Wilderness Survival Guide, this type of precipitation does not normally cause damage to characters who are caught out in the open when it occurs, as long as the character takes simple precautions, as long as they are keep moving. Obviously, the person who wrote this has never been in an ice or sleet yeah, storm. Yeah, I was going to say, so if they're big enough, they hurt. <laughs> because I have... Um, and I'm sure some of us have. 
I'm sure Will and both myself have been inside ice sleet storms with our military service. It's well, not fun. No, if you serve, not. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you must have served above the Arctic Circle and at nighttime it gets minus 40, minus 50, and that stuff's coming down, it hurts. Uh, you could be, uh, you could, I've been in like a, a sleet storm like here just in Ohio, and it's not fun. Mm. <laughs> but it says exposed skin and lightly clothed parts of the body must be covered promptly. Regardless of whether the characters are stationary or moving, failure to do so will result in the character taking cold damage. It goes on from there. It's really kind of common sense there. Uh, a little more, uh, you get damage from heat or cold. Now, this is where really, uh, I think, what we're driving at. Uh, when we're talking about cold, depend- we're, I guess we'll talk about, I guess, below freezing, below 32 degrees here. Mm-hmm. Basically, from 31 up, you're not going to take any damage. There's a nice table on page 26 where it tells you what the personal temperature of the character may be. And there's where it says unprotected and protected. Unprotected, there says con and damage. And there's what you need to do is you need to make a constitution check, I believe, every three turns. And there's a modifier to that. Uh, pluses are bad because <laughs> that just adds to yep. the, the D20 roll. And then if you fail the con check, you take X amount of damage on the right-hand side. Actually, there's a that's your maximum amount of damage. So let's say you failed your con check because it's 10 degrees outside. So you'll take anywhere between one to three points of damage after those three rounds. Uh, also, and you do those checks every three rounds. So I would use this sort of stuff if they were going to be in a constantly cold environment. Give an example uh, against the Giants, the Frost Giant section. You might want to use these rules if you feel so inclined. Um, also, It goes on the talking about hyperthermia and frostbite. Where it gets into hyperthermia is if you failed six consecutive constitution checks for cold damage, the character will begin to suffer the effects of hyperthermia. And then you'll lose one point per turn thereafter from his physical ability scores. So strength decks and con will take each a point hit. And at one point every two turns from his wisdom score to a minimum of three in any category. If two of his physical ability scores drop to three, the character is incapacitated. And one D3 turns thereafter, he falls unconscious. And two D4 turns after that, he will die regardless of hit points remaining. Oh. Yeah. You can't, you can't pull an Eric Cartman and freeze yourself till Nintendo Wii comes out? Um, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. And then, they, and then they have uh, <laughs> rules here for frostbite and the chances of you, you losing, you know, appendages here. <laughs> so, but you know what? I got a question about that. What happens if you have a ring of regeneration on? Oh. Well, re- you're probably... <laughs> ring of regeneration only recovers hit points. <laughs> yeah, and the thing says regardless of the hit points, he still dies, right? Right. So it would, it would make no difference. Right. Because you're not talking about, I guess, damage as in physical... You know, well, actually, I mean the lost limbs. Oh, if, you, oh. if you lose, like, fingers and toes, wouldn't a ring, ring of regeneration prevent that? I think so. Well, it'll <laughs> generate hit points, but it won't regenerate the limbs. I believe a ring of regeneration does not regenerate limbs. Am I correct on that? I'm pretty sure that's all it does. Yeah, it just regenerates hit points. I think the spell itself does regenerate. Yeah, yes. It's good to go. But I do not believe the ring does. I've so, always ruled it that way, so. <laughs> so, yeah, there's rules for frostbite damage, table number 10 in there. And if you take um, where it says, wherever the effective temperature for a character is zero or lower and his hands, feet, or ears are exposed or improperly covered, any cold damage he suffers will affect the vulnerability, vulnerable extremities first, and the character may develop frostbite. So there's, you know, whatever body 
appendage has been either exposed or in this case you can even say compromised because you could have your hands and feet covered but if those hands like your hands and feet might be covered with boots and like and gloves if they get wet and you're in sub-zero temperatures you're gonna get frostbite yeah i mean so those things you gotta kind of take into consideration so, so remember to wear your long johns when you go out and uh yeah. yes so th- there's all those rules in the uh wilderness survival guide and a few of the things that happen um but you know what, kids? When you go adventuring, dress for the weather. You know. <laughs> yeah. And I just looked up the ring of regeneration, and it says it does not otherwise cause regeneration or restore life, limb, or organ. So that's what I thought. Yeah. Hey, what is that? Only what, what, regenerates hit points. Which one is that? Uh, ring the of ring of regeneration. Oh, okay, because I'm seeing here it says the standard regeneration ring restores one hit point of damage and will replace lost limbs or organs eventually, also per term. It will bring its word back from death, but if poison's the cause, the saving throw must be made or else blah, 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 blah. Hmm. And that's page 130 of the DMG. Right. And then <laughs> later on in that same section, though, it says it does not otherwise cause regeneration, restore life, limb, or organ. Ain't that amazing? What? So it kind yeah. of fix itself right there. Yeah. Hmm. So, so I guess it's pretty DM fiat then. Yeah. Wow, within the same paragraph. I never caught that before. Gary contradicted himself. If he wrote anyway, it. Anyway. If he wrote that. Uh, if he even wrote that, true. Oh, so, now, understand that, that that second part is referring to the ring of vampiric regeneration. Oh, okay. There's two rings discussed, there's two rings discussed there. There's two rings discussed there. There's a ring of regeneration. Okay. Yeah, I see that now. Comes, yeah, there's two rings. Oh, okay. Okay. So a ring of regeneration will give you your fingers back. That vampiric regeneration will not. That is correct. Yeah, and yeah. So the first one will replace limbs and organs. I was thinking of the vampiric. Okay, my bad. So a no, it's all good. Ring, a standard ring of regeneration. Oh no, you don't understand. We gotta let our people know out there that we were we were wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're correcting ourselves. Yes. <laughs> otherwise, it's gonna come out on the forums and say you guys were dumb. You missed that. <laughs> dumb. <laughs> That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here to do buy the book. Yep. <laughs> so, anywho, um, anywho, I'm just throwing this out there. Would any of you uh, gentlemen uh, use these Where? rules? I guess uh, for. The cold and freezing rules. Uh, I'll start with you, Vince. Would you use these rules in certain circumstances, maybe? Yes, I would definitely use those rules. Uh, I like them, actually. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, uh, What about you, Will? Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. And you know what? If you brought up the example of the uh, the giant series, that'd be a great place for those for those kind of temperatures. But I tell you, another place where it would play even more of a factor, and that's if the players for some some chance got to like the uh, seventh and eighth layers of uh, of hell and everything, because it's supposed to be very frigid down there that's where Metastopheles right. in the mouth. Yes. Very good point. Yeah, that's another place you would definitely use. Them. What about because you, Matt? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. I could definitely see myself using these as well. I remember when I first started playing and I had the old uh, original World of Greyhawk box set, one of my favorite things to do was actually plot out the weather for, like, the month of adventuring. So, yeah, and I didn't have this book at the time, but having that weather charted out, okay, on this day's when the snow hits, yeah, I could definitely have some fun with this. Because something that we didn't mention, though, is the effects of temperature. You actually, depending on your personal temperature, your strength, dex, and constitution are also affected. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that oh, yes. it, it makes it, I think, a, if you want to add a little bit of realism, I think this is what this is doing. Yeah. yeah you, and it, I think it also works uh, for using these sorts of rules. And conversely, for ones for heat and, and being in hot environments is in a game tournament where you might be in an environment and I know I've done this before uh, where in a tournament you are in a completely cold ice snow environment and you're kind of racing against time 
because the more you're outside, the more you're exposed to these things. That kind of hurries people along a little bit more. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, and it's also great for the players that like trotting around everywhere in their full plate mail, no matter mm -hmm. if it's summer or what. Yeah. Full plate will give you <laughs> some protection, but, you know, beware of frostbite, my friends. Yes, but when areas. it comes to summer, though, that full plate mail might not be the best idea. Because no. it, yeah, because it gives you, an, in 76 degrees or higher, it gives you a plus 40 to your personal yeah. temperature. So, yeah, you'll be overheating pretty quick if you're not careful in full plate. You're a, you're a paladin baked potato by then. Yeah. So. Why did the paladin <laughs> fall over and he's breathing like a dog? Oh, maybe because he's overheating. <laughs> oh, no, the One paladin thing. has a heat stroke. <laughs> Yes. No, see, but one thing that also that I didn't think covered that much in the book itself was that uh, when you're in cold weather climates and everything, the increase of rations and water because it did cover dehydration on there because mm -hmm. in cold weather you will you'll have to eat more to to burn more body heat mm -hmm. and of course yes. you want to drink more. But again, you know, we're talking about the realism effect. Just a point. Yeah, no, that's a very good point because you, you and I know from from our military training that even in cold weather environments, you're you got to stack on the calories and you still have to stay hydrated. Yes, and don't drink ale because it doesn't, it doesn't warm you up. No, it does not. <laughs> For a brief time, it'll feel like it will. Yeah, <laughs> it'll so, just be you, know, you got that dwarven fighter in your group who's running around. You know, with just the cod piece on and the battle axe, he goes, eh, I'm drinking the ale, I'll be fine out here. Well, for a while. <laughs> ten minutes. Give him ten minutes tops and he'll say, I'm c -c cold. <laughs> <laughs> My ale's c -c cold and frozen. It's an ice pop. <laughs> oh, good. You have a nice frosty mug. And you have a nice frosty mug. Uh, <laughs> so, um... I guess we can um, put a freeze to that topic. <laughs> so let us know what you think out there if you use these sorts of uh, rules for snow and cold and freezing. Um, let us know uh, either at osrgaming.org or you know, drop us an email at RFI, RFI staff at gmail.com. Nice. I remembered it again, didn't I? Yes, you did. <laughs> Or, you know, give us a call on our hotline. So I guess uh, we will move on to our next feature, which is Creature of Feature. That is not dead, not scared, not scared, not scared, not scared, not scared, not scared, and with strange ears, yeah, even death may die. die, 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 die. I welcome the unwary to the Creature Feature Theater. And now we are in the Creature Feature Theater, where we're going to take a look at a monster from our favorite monster book, The Fiend Folio. And oh, this joy! Yes, I know. <laughs> and this monster actually has some origin based in uh, uh, real-world mythology. Because, yes, it does. Yes, it's actually, its name is actually Russian for water. It mm -hmm. is. There's actually two pronunciations for it yeah. that I discovered in the pronunciation guide for monsters from Dragon number 93, page 24. It's either the Vodyanoi or Vodyanoi. I like Vodyanoi. I like the Vodyanoi, too. It, it just rolls off better. So, but our monster here, it, it is a, kind of an aquatic version of the Umber Hulk. It lives in deep, uh, fresh bodies of water. It's similar in, to that of uh, Umber Hulk, except it only has two eyes. It's like has green skin, slimy with web claws. It's preys large freshwater creatures, but considers humans a particular delicacy. So. And uh, they're also very territorial and will defend the area around their lairs. They've got powerful claws that they can render hulls of passing ships or even capsize smaller vessels. So basically, they're a nice little uh, sea monster or a Loch Ness monster you could throw in to uh, taunt any seafaring uh, boats you may have. Um, so they found in salt and seawater. 
Uh, this version is just uh, referencing Freshwater. In Dragon Magazine, however, they uh, that's where they present you the C, uh, Marine variant. And that is in uh, Dragon Issue 68, page 40. Hoorah, it's the Marine variant. <laughs> yes. Yes, the Marine variant actually, ha- it, the, its description actually has a little more to it. Um <laughs> Because the it says that these predators, the marine variant, fear nothing. Um, they have the ability to change color. The deep sea, they're like solid black, and and they can also go brown for sand. Uh, they're kind of a chameleon like. Uh, opponents are surprised on a roll of one to three on a d six. Infravision and ultravision will not help detect their presence since they're cold blooded creatures. Mm. Their normal swimming rate is slow, but are able to have burst to speeds up to 24 feet for short periods. Um, they often will just use that to rush at their prey from a hiding place. Uh, it's like an underwater charge. Uh, they prey on medium and large sized creatures, so, and mm. they like ripping out hulls of vessels more than twice as large as itself, and they capsize boats less than twice its size. Wow. So, yeah. So, really, this is a monster that you would use if you have any sort of, like, say, like a tie. The, your character's going to be on a boat for a while and you just want something to occupy them through the course of, like, their two month journey between continents. Or you could even have them be like a focal point where the shipping lanes to the port town are being tormented by this evil sea creature and the adventurers have to save the town and the economy. By vanquishing it. Like, like a Loch Ness monster or something. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Creature from the Black Lagoon kind of thing. I was thinking yeah. that too, yeah. You know, it's funny that when we ha- we're using this creature, the Vodyanoi, um, I actually uh, incorporated this creature into when I was running uh, the whole Salt Marsh series, the U series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, now, spoiler alert for everybody, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, whoever's listening, so you can go over years, go la, 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 so you won't have to hear. 30 years, but, Nick. They have plenty of time to read it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying. 30 years, I think they have enough time to read it. Fine. Anyway, the last module where you go up against the actual Sahuagin layer, right? They have, there's, I think it's the second level is there's a there's an arena and one of the creatures I incorporated in an arena that that the Sahuagin were fighting was a Vadyanoi <laughs> and, oh cool uh, yeah uh, luckily the player characters uh, didn't get to run into the thing because uh, they actually ran into something much worse the <laughs> thing actually left because the the uh, Sahuagin were uh, Bring up a defense against the player characters, and the Vadinoi got 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 away. But yeah, I was going to incorporate that, and they were going to have the, this nice uh, pitch battle with the Vadinoi. <laughs> they were using it like as a like a big type pit monster that they were all going to fight. So yeah, it's a really cool creature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I definitely see if you have any sort of seafaring campaign. It's definitely something to throw in. Just even if you, the characters never run into it, just throwing it out there for the flavor of there's this. They see people see this sea monster, but others don't believe it. It's all yeah. myth. So, well, yeah. I just think you know that it's based off of the Umber Hulk. You know, Umber yeah. Hulk's pretty nasty in itself. Was it eight plus eight hit hit dice or something like that? Yeah, yeah. The the marine variety is. 12 plus 6 hit dice. Yeah. Yeah. Three yeah, attacks. nasty. Mm. Yeah. And it's doing 4 to 20. So it's 46 damage for two of its attacks, and its other attack is 2d8. Yeah. So, so this is the big nasty at the end that you probably would run into. Yeah, I see this as being a very severe threat, especially if the uh, the boat's out in, you know, in the middle of the ocean and this creature attacks. Well, if the creature likes to attack it from underneath to sink it, well, the player's got some problems. They better have a yeah. flying carpet or something. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's one of those, how long can you tread water? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we have that paladin that we were talking about that was wearing the full plate mail. Yeah. 
<laughs> sloop, 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 sloop. Yes. He'll make a nice sinker. Yeah. <laughs> make a nice new boat anchor. <laughs> well, yeah. you'll be fine if you get on your boat with Roy Schneider. You'll be fine. He'll, he'll just kill it. That, that's true. Smile, you son of a bloom. Yeah, Nick. <laughs> yeah. I said son of a bloom. Oh, son of a bloom. Okay, fine. Yeah. I, 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 what I think is I think, I think of the Jaws monster now. I don't know for some reason. This big yeah. creature trying to attack the boat and kill everything that's in the water. Wasn't there a real lame sci-fi channel movie where they kind of like made a shark that could breathe out of out of water? I could have sworn there was. I'm sure there was. Yeah, I I, I could almost remember. I think I remember picking it up one Sunday that they, where they always show their lame uh, productions. I don't think Tiffany or uh, was in it though. So Tiffany. Yeah. She was in like Crocosaurus or something like that. <laughs> Giant piranha Crocosaurus. Wow. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh, Nick. Someone what? spent a little too much time watching C grade uh, horror, fl- uh, horror flicks on side. I am an MST3K fan, so. Bleh. Yeah, so am I, but I, come on. <laughs> With, without the two robots and Joel or Mike. I can't watch those movies. I didn't no. say I watched the whole film. My God, I maybe caught two minutes of it. <laughs> Some of them were so bad that I don't understand how they sat the room. Right. They did it for the money, like an assassin. No, not in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning, they did it for fun. Yes. So, that's the creature. Do you use it? How do you use I, it? I like it. Oh, we'll definitely like it. So much potential. Write us, tell us, and we'll head into uh, the Dragon's Horde. As the secret portal yields to your efforts, you stand amazed at a vision from the most fevered dreams of avarice. Before you lies the Dragon's Horde. Dragon's Horde this week. We have a magical item called the Robe of Eyes. Now, how worthless is this stupid item? <laughs> oh, well, let's just get right out the gate here. It's, it's I mean, you, you put this thing on. It has this weird pattern of eyes on it. You're like, ooh. It looks like a normal robe with a really crappy pattern on it. You put it on, <laughs> and the first thing you do is you can see all around you within the 12-inch, well, you know, scale is for a mini 12-inch radius around you. So you can't be surprised. Whoop de doo. I mean the first put But this... you get infravision, you get ultra vision. Yeah, big deal. And <laughs> <laughs> and how did, how does this give you the ability to track as a twelfth level ranger? Because it's magic. No because <laughs> it's magic, yeah. I know that, but yeah. why seeing all around you does it give you the ability to twack track Blech, twack, yeah. As a twelfth level ranger. I don't understand that. Because you can... I you're able to see all the little broken twigs better and or the little indentations in the ground maybe. Yeah, you can see everything around you but God forbid that rock gets in the way. You ain't seeing past that rock. So, But the good thing about it is you can see invisible characters uh, or creatures. Uh, people hiding in camouflage or hiding in shadows instantly. Right. So you can't be surprised. I don't know. This magical item I would probably just sell it. I wouldn't bother with it. Yeah, because if you're hit by a light or a continual light, you're blinded. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For a long maybe- time. Maybe if your job is to just protect, like, a trade caravan going through a forest, it could be useful. Why do we always use that example? Trade caravan going through a forest. So if you were sitting down on the caravan, would you be seeing, like, the bench because you could see all around you? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) You would see the bench. No, I could actually put the guy on a very high pole wearing the rope of eyes so you can see all around. Standing on the cart with his hands out, right? Yes. (laughs) Yes. It's like our radar. A pole with a bicycle seat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ouch. Um, yeah. That would hurt us a while. It points to the danger. Yes. Now, other than that, I would just sell it. I mean, this, it's too... It's kind of cheesy in a way. I don't really like it. Would I use it as a plot device? No, but maybe like Matt said. Yeah, or, I mean, it, it has specifics. What, Nick? A robe of ears. <sighs> Nick. Oh, no. We're what? not getting... We got to do this before the show, and now you're bringing it up in the show. <laughs> oh, sorry. 
<laughs> what, what with noses now or smells next? At least with the robe of nose, you could tell who dealt it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we're 12 again. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, you got to figure if there is a robe of eyes, why not have like a robe of ears? I don't with, know. Then, the, then you get into the whole thing with the robe of tongue. And I just don't even want to think about that. <laughs> really don't. And I do look like <laughs> Jagger. Yeah. That's Gene Simmons' robe, yeah. I would think when putting this robe on for the very first time, your character would have to roll a system shock. Because you might poke your eye out? No. Oh. Wouldn't you think putting this on for the first time and having this big, giant vision of everything all around you would shock the crap out of you? Yeah. In fact, if I had Call Cthulhu rules, I might make a sanity roll. Yeah. Well, we don't have sanity, but I would say it's just a shock. Saying. I mean, you yeah. wouldn't die or anything. You just kind of right. pass out for like or faint right. or something. Yeah, it'd be that's very yeah. disorienting. Yeah. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it's just a big sensory uh, overload and everything of your eye and everything, your brain trying to understand everything that's going on around you. Yeah. So there you go. I tell you that my biggest fear wearing this thing is, you know, seeing all these eyes pop up open and everything, looking around. I would think that a gibbering mouth was attacking someone. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we can make this any more useful. Well, I think, like I said, you use it for a guy who's going to be on point. You know, he's searching for everything. Yeah, I mean, it does give you abilities to track as a twelfth level ranger. Now, what if you put it on inside out? Um, it works like an X-ray. I don't know. <laughs> You'd well, see... if you ever wanted to see parts of your body you weren't meant to see, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what a colon looks like. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what that mole is on my. Uh, anyway, <laughs> well, if you wanted to do your own dental work, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah, <laughs> the book, the self dentistry book. Oh, that's how you do it. Yeah. All right, so we, we we figured that out. Robo eyes. Kind of a lame magic item. My eyes. What do you guys think, Matt? In your eyes. Oh, uh, are. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that they just kind of threw in the book because, on the surface, the idea of being able to see everything sounds great, but then in execution, it just doesn't really work all that well. No. So no. I don't think it's I'd... too bad. Nick, you don't think it's too bad, huh? No, it has it has its limits. Like I said, with either. A light or a continual light spell hitting you, you're going to be blinded for X amount of rounds. Bright but, light. I mean, it does have its uses. Bright light, bright light. Exactly. What do you think, Will? Well, it has some potential and everything. And after all these years of playing, I don't think I ever, you know, gave out a robe of eyes, you know, or I never found one, as a matter of fact. So <laughs> it has its potential. But honestly, with a, with, a, with a magical item of this nature, this is something I would probably place in a, uh, in a tournament module. And then have a room affect someone if they're wearing it. Mm. Oh, that's just mean. <laughs> yes. I like it. Okay. <laughs> uh, tell us if you used it, because we'd be interested to in see how you use it. Maybe if you modified it. Uh, or if I staff at gmail.com, we'll head into our uh, last segment of the night. Time is short now. They are coming swiftly. And we have but a moment. You must make your voice heard now. Cast your ballot against the ten-foot pole. So, the last segment of the night is our ten-foot pole. We have a good one this week. I hope you guys had a chance to vote before the show. I did. Go to RFI... RFI staff, yeah. I'm gonna do, <laughs> no, I just pulled a Nick. RFI staff.com. RFI podcast.com. And you pulled ten- a Nick. <laughs> yes. I pulled a oh, Nick. Har, hardy, har, har. <laughs> <laughs> the Make poll- sure I don't pull a Vince, then. <laughs> uh, listen, this is the poll. Listening outside the door, you find out the town mayor is corrupt. What do you do? Option one, burst in and kill him. Option two, kidnap him and beat him until he admits it publicly. Option three, black ha- blackmail him for all he's got. Option four. Tell the authorities about what you found and let them deal with it. Which one did you pick, Matthew? Oh, I pick the you kidnap him and beat him until he admits it publicly. Because <laughs> if the mayor's corrupt, 
<laughs> that means the police are going to be corrupt, too. Exactly. So if you tell the authorities, he is the authority. So why are you going to tell him he's corrupt? That's what I voted for, too. In fact, that is in the lead right now with 36%. Nick? I voted tell the authorities. Uh, all right. And uh, Will? Unfortunately, my option wasn't there. My option would have been hire an assassin. <laughs> if, nice. if you had to pick one of the four <laughs> no I'm sorry I, I can't beat the guy up so I would have chose the same thing as uh, Nick there did I would have contacted authorities say he's a corrupt take care of the problem and they would have went sure 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 stuffed the gold in their pocket they just got no the dead we kill him oh okay and okay. then hire an assassin to kill him again yeah, okay yes so that's going to end the show for this week Bye. No, okay. That uh, ends the show. Uh, oh, fine. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back next week with another show and uh, full crew as usual. And hope everybody enjoyed the show. And remember, keep it original, keep it old school. And thanks, everybody. Good night, Bye, everybody. Good night. Take care. for initiative.